Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. I feel like I should probably start this podcast with a warning. Not particularly about the content of the conversation or what you're about to hear. You'll be able to tell we were having a great time. More really about the things you're inevitably going to want to go and check out once you've heard this. I'm just saying you're going to need a strong stomach. Um, I'll explain more about that in a minute. Welcome to episode 17 of Midnight Chats. Thank you to all those who tuned in to Mike Skinner on the last one with Stuart. I'm Greg and my guest on this one was Flying Lotus. Um... Maybe you'll know his work well, or maybe you don't. Uh, He's Stephen Ellison, a Los Angeles-based musician, head of his own record label, and now a film director. He's the grandnephew of famous jazz pianist Alice Coltrane. Um, He broke through about 10 years ago, I suppose, with his albums 1983 and The Brilliant Los Angeles. And since then, he's gone on to collaborate with artists like Radiohead's Tom York, Kendrick Lamar, and Doom. Um, But before that, he actually studied film at university, and that was kind of his first great artistic love. Now, we took this episode out of the office and into a charming old cinema in central London. We got our water and settled into a pair of rickety old seats in front of the big screen. The reason was because Flying Lotus's label, Brain Feeder, Um, that already releases music from some amazing names has expanded into movies with the launch of Brain Feeder Films. Um, Flying Lotus was in London um, to screen his recent short film and invited some friends along to show their material, like David Firth, who's the animator behind the brilliant, surreal web series Salad Fingers. Um, Now... I guess Flying Lotus has been quite quiet on the music scene since his last album, You're Dead, because he's been working on his first feature film, which is called Kuso, and he gives an update on the progress of how that's all going in this as well. So, uh, I guess back to the warning that I gave you back at the top. This short film, um, Flying Lotus's short film, Royal, which we're talking about in the podcast, is definitely not for the faint-hearted. It is a disgusting, graphic, disturbing, but still darkly funny story that involves a lot of sweating and a lot of vomiting. Um, Don't watch it on a public train station platform like I did. Um, Put it this way, when he showed it at the... Sundance Festival for the first time back in August he gave everybody in the audience a sick bag so maybe that gives you some idea of uh, the kind of thing we're talking about here anyway enough from me if you're enjoying the Midnight Chat series don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe um, wherever you're listening Um, thanks for joining us I will leave you with episode 17 this is Flying Lotus Welcome to Midnight Chats. Um, Thank you. It's great to have you with us. We've we've taken the podcast to some interesting locations before now. Nice. But right now we're sat in um, a kind of ornate, old-fashioned <laughs> cinema. Old-fashioned. Yeah, yeah, in uh, in central London in, on Regent Street. From where we're sat, we're sat in a couple of uh, pea green velvet seats. <laughs> about right. Yeah. Um, I just met the projectionist, who was a nice nice guy. What I like. Out in the foyer, I've just seen there's loads of kind of pensioners milling around because they've just finished like a matinee screening of yeah. like Wind in the Willows or like <laughs> Mamma Mia or something. <laughs> and they're like mixing with the brain feeder crew. That's, that's just, cool. That's a good picture for people. That's right? fine. The reason we're here is because tonight brain feeder films kind of launches as such in the UK and you're going to yeah. be screening some films. Before we get going, kind of just tell us a bit about what's going to happen tonight and what the people that are coming are going to expect. First off, it's, it's so crazy. This is crazy to be here. You know, it's different going with your own piece and, you know, bringing your own experience to one. Uh, So, yeah, I'm actually having a bit of a moment with that. 
but um, yeah, tonight we're gonna we're gonna kick off and we're gonna really um, kind of kick off with David Firth. Uh, he's a, a kind of a, a legend in the, the animation circle. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just been working away at some really really crazy stuff, and yeah, we we linked up with him. And uh, it's been really cool just seeing all the stuff that he's been coming up with. But now we get to unleash it on people. Yeah. And as well as, like, one of my projects as yeah, well. which so is Royal, right? Which is Royal, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. This is going to be fun. This place we're in now is very much the kind of quintessentially British take on a movie theatre. Mm-hmm. In the sense that, like, the decor and the fact that there's a kind of old-fashioned looking projector at the back of the venue uh, kind of was whirring away earlier until they turned it off. Um, so this is this is quite a kind of unique setting for what you're going to do tonight. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about, before we start talking about film more in general and your, your kind of passion for it, tell us a bit about Royal and... Because uh, it's a short film that you made. Mm-hmm. You premiered it at um, Sundance in Los Angeles back at, at the end of the summer. Yeah. Um, but this is the first time it'll be shown in the UK. <coughs> Tell us a bit about that short. Uh, Royal is uh, is just a, a horrible nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I'll let you explain it, and then I'll tell you where I watched it. <laughs> oh God, you saw it already. Oh, uh, good. Yeah, it's a horrible nightmare. That um, if you watch it with your uh, significant other, they're probably going to make you get tested after you watch it. Um, don't ever watch it, actually. If you hear about this thing, just run away. It's so bad. No, um, no I'm actually really proud of it. Um, it was really fun to, to create because it was it really was a very organic piece of art. I wrote it very quickly and created it very quickly, but it was there was a lot of love that went into it, and it was it was a lot of um, a lot of artistry and you know a lot of you know, people sacrificing their their time to to work on something really silly, you know. So it was, yeah, it's a, it was, it's definitely a passion project, but it all happened like it was meant to be, like mm. this thing was meant to exist. So, you know, <laughs> it all just kind of unraveled in this horrible, beautifully horrible movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, for, for the people that haven't seen it yet, it's kind of 15 minutes. I'm not going to obviously spoil it, but it's, uh, it focuses around a couple and their relationship and they have these kind of, uh, skin <laughs> boils. Uh, I can't believe you're going to make me try and explain this, man. Nah. You described it as nightmarish, but it is—it is a kind of. Um, it's how can how can it's like yes, yeah, it's just a nightmare. It's just a bad dream. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of dream. disgusting and very very compelling at the same time, and it's, it is fantastically put together. So Thanks. you must be really happy with it. In terms of your um, your own kind of relationship with with filmmaking and your passion for film. I'm sure that over the years you've been asked tons about what the first record was that you bought or what the first music was that you heard that influenced the stuff that you've subsequently kind of gone out and made. Can you recall the first time you stepped into into a cinema to watch a film and, wh- and what was it? The first movie that I can remember seeing was like, oh man a Fievel movie or something like okay. that. Fievel. Fievel goes yeah. west. <laughs> One of those Fievel movies or like... Was Fievel a hamster? It was like American, American Tale. It was a mouse, wasn't he? Yeah, it was probably a mouse. And he had yeah. a little knapsack on his back. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah, guy. yeah, you know that guy. <laughs> it was probably like a Fievel movie or, yeah, something like that. Mine was a Muppet's Christmas Carol. Oh, yeah? <laughs> That's a good one, though. It's all right, isn't it? Yeah, not a bad place to start. Yeah, some of the first record I bought was the Ghostbusters theme tune, mm. and the first movie I saw was the Muppets Christmas Yeah, the Ghostbusters record, too, yeah. yeah, yeah of course, yeah. yeah. I think the same. I think that was really? probably my first record, yeah. There probably the same thing. So you must be 30. Um, we're roughly, we're of the same era. Same. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> have to be there. Have to be. What's, um, from there, what were the kind of... Uh, what were the first movie genres that you found yourself really kind of getting into, say, as like a, a as sort of a teenager? As or? a teenager, yeah. I was, as a teenager, I was really getting into horror. And I think it was like, it was so cool for me because I think for a while, as a kid, I was really scared of those kinds of things. I was really scared of Thriller. You know, I was really scared of Robocop even. You know, like there was, it was just like for a long time. And then one day it just was like, 
seeing some like bloody ass movie and I was like, yeah, that shit is tight. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that shit is dope. Bring on the gore. You know, and I was like, yeah, that Freddy Krueger, let's run that. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> like that shit used to scare the death out of me, man. Like Freddy Krueger was the worst. I still have Freddy Krueger dreams. Really? <laughs> yeah. Do you? My my one is, uh, do you remember the Hellraiser movies? Oh, Pinhead? You get yeah. Pinhead dreams? So I used shit. to go into Blockbuster Video, right? <laughs> And you'd go and uh, you'd be looking for the never-ending story, right? Yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. or Dumb and Dumber or something. They just like yeah. nice, kind of gentle Saturday night. And then night they feeling. change the fucking racks around, and you go to the wrong section. <laughs> and it's like a six-foot version of Pinhead. Yeah. <laughs> and as a whatever, I don't know, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, I was absolutely horrified. Yeah. That guy has always stayed with me. That's great, man. <laughs> Doug Bradley. <Yeah. laughs> Before you were focusing on mu- music, you you studied film, right? I did, yeah. So was it the ambition always to be a film director to yep, make movies? Absolutely, okay. yeah. And uh, sound designer. Okay. I really wanted to do that, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and how were those studies? Did, 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 you, did you love it? Did you make you know, really small loved, films when you I were really doing that? I really loved it, yeah. I really loved it. But at the same time, I just felt like you know, I really gained knowledge by doing, mm. you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where it, it's really good to get your technical chops together, I guess, and to have a technical understanding, but there's nothing that can prepare you for making a film other mm. than like actually just jumping in and doing it. Mm. And I think that's what held me back for so long is like I felt like I needed to know more. I needed to learn more and like live more, mm. have more experiences and stuff. But the reality is I just had to jump in and just do it and fuck up, figure myself out, learn in the process, find my style in the process, all that stuff. It's all, that's the only way you can learn, Mm. you know. So, you know, with this, this is like, this is just like, I felt like, okay, I can do this one. Mm. I can do this. Now I'm just trying to think of like. Okay, what, what what kind of stunt shit could I do? You know, like crazy stunts. You know, like you know, how can we do some like crazy wire work? You know, just things that I I haven't even tried to do mm. now. You know, like that's such a science fiction concept mm. to me that I have stunt coordinators and like choreography and all that shit. Like, damn, I want to try it now. Yeah. You know, so. And what is it like? Um it's a totally different skill to what you would do day to day with with the music or running the label or any of those types of things. But like being behind the camera or looking at the edit, yeah. How have you found that? How have you what, what you like when you're on set? Are you kind of are you. It's a, being a film director. I presume is a little bit like being a producer or something in the sense that you're kind of you're orchestrating things. You're contr- yeah. you're pulling the strings. And Absolutely. Such. So how how does it compare? In one way, it feels real natural. Okay. In one way, it feels so natural because it's like having to describe your ideas to musicians to get them to play mm. a certain thing, you know, that you hear in your head. It's kind of the same thing. But with this, it's just there's so many people. There's so It's just a big-ass collaboration, mm. really. But I'll tell you, man, making a movie is fucked. Really? Making a movie is fucked up. And, like, yo, honestly, anybody who's ever made a movie, hats off to you shitty movie or not hats off to you because it's hard dude mm. it's really hard it's the hardest thing is the, ever is the what's the <laughs> i mean is it is it hard in planning it everything making it everything delivering it everything. distributing it it's a fucking miracle that any of them happen man seriously <laughs> what why so what what, what are things have you discovered so, through the process there's so you many think like that? elements and variables and there's so many you know, there's always room for things to fall apart, you know, and you're counting on 20, 30, 50, 60 people, more than that, 300 people <laughs> to like your idea. You're hoping that they kind of like your idea enough to, like, give a fuck, mm. to do their jobs, like, beyond, you know, above and beyond, you know, what what they kind of do on their resume mm. anyway. You know, it's like... You know, trying to get 30 people to like be on board, trying to get, you know, all these people who have no idea who you are to actually like be down. And it's like, it's hard, man. Mm-hmm. It's hard. And it's hard to, you know, get your, if you have a vision, if you have an idea, if you actually have things you want to do, it's hard to get them just out of your mind. And Cause it- it was interesting mm-hmm. when, when I was trying to, I could barely articulate what Royal is about earlier. Like, yeah. 
how do you find it trying to articulate it's it's the kind of film that uh, comes from deep from in somebody's imagination and when you try and describe it to it you describe it to somebody you're kind of like well, it's kind of like gruesome it's a bit sick but it's kind of darkly funny and also quite compelling mm -hmm. and so how did you find it when you had first had the idea sitting amongst friends or whoever it was trying to articulate what it was <laughs> dude it's funny because the way I write is way harder than how the end result is. So I think people were way worried before they even saw it. You know, like they you know read the things that was, was happening and they read the dialogue and like, wow, dude, really? That's how you think, bro? You know, they they just heard you know you until the quiet right. comes and they you know they see it all this you know they hear all these records that you know they. You know, it has you know beautiful vibe to it. You know, and then they read the script. They're like, what the fuck is that shit, man? Mm -hmm. Is that how you really feel? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. But um, it's a, uh, it's uh, yeah, it is hard to describe. But that's why I have Photoshop and stuff. And yeah. you know, I have, you know, you have references and you pull references and you kind of get people in the headspace. And what's cool is I have the music too. You yeah. know, like. Just giving somebody a soundtrack or like a musical cue kind of informs them of the vibe mm -hmm. at, at the very least. So that really, that really, it's really helpful. One of the things that um, that I did notice in Will and kind of also reading around the kind of stuff that you've made before and and talked about your enjoyment of is there's always this sort of dark comic streak running yeah. through it, right? Yeah. It's sick, but it's funny. Right. And I think that. One of the things I, I read that you'd mentioned was like the influence of like growing up cartoons like Ren and Stimpy. Absolutely. Which I always remember my mother being like horrified. Hated that shit, huh? So, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I hated was, it. And I, I must admit, I watched what are you watching? Yeah, oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I must admit, today was probably the first time that I've watched an episode of Ren and Stimpy for about ten years. But I also just remember thinking, today I thought, wow, was the sort of 10 year old me watching Ren and Stimpy like it's just it's so some of those things that are kind of made that are aimed at young people just come from the wildest of imagination oh, yeah. as with many of the best shows that have been made that almost are on the surface for you know children or whatever so you're, you're like uh, The Simpsons or there's so many levels going on and Ren and Stimpy is just like that oh right? yeah Oh yeah, <laughs> you used to enjoy that. Oh man, I still enjoy it. This the sound effects and stuff as well that you all used in Royal. Yeah. All of it, man. I I enjoy it all so much. And actually, before we were shooting, I played episodes for everybody just to get them in the headspace, get the actors in the headspace. Right, like, this is where we're going. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, I want that bit where yeah. his eyeball explodes. Exactly, isn't it? like this is where we're going. Like, okay, <laughs> why didn't you do this like two days ago? Should have just shown me. Okay, that's what you want. Okay, I got you. You know, it was like, Amazing. but uh, yeah, I, I every every shoot that I've done, I've actually played Rin and Stimpy before Brilliant. as a reference to someone. There is something about it that just makes you immediately puts you in the headspace of understanding where you're coming from. I think. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think what the beauty of that was just like anything goes, and then the next shot, it's all good. With the stuff that's happening tonight with Brain Feeder. As you say, you're going to be showing um, your short film, Royal. Um, David Firth's doing some stuff as well. Like this, to be able to have uh, grown with the success that you've had musically and with the label to the point where, as we've talked about, you've always loved film and always wanted to do film, that you're now being able to kind of put it under the brain feeder umbrella and do things like this. To an outsider, that looks like a amazing thing to be able to do right is it does it feel great it feels great yeah it feels absolutely great man um you know i just uh it feels great that? especially to be able to help david you know because i I've, I've always been a fan of his since mm -hmm. the very beginning the new grounds mm -hmm. era i've been a fan of his and i've always wanted something for him i wanted to see him succeed i wanted to see his work be elevated to a place where it, it needs to be, mm. you know, uh, and I just think that he's always just needed to push and he's always needed a, like a, a team to get behind him um, to help realize the things in his mind because they're so unique and, uh, and you know, just like Ren and Stimpy, I think he's influenced so many animators and so many filmmakers actually too and, and 
he probably has no idea. Mm. You know, maybe he does. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, maybe he does. But uh, he's. I mean, for people that maybe don't recognize his name, you might have heard of Salad Fingers, which Salad is Fingers, his web yeah. series, which is is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing as shit. <laughs> it's super crazy. What other are you like? Have you got any of the current favorites of kind of like? Uh, online web series in the office we tend to watch um don't hug me i'm scared don't right? hug me i'm scared that's which, great which is amazing yeah there's a few really good things i love uh demo and darren okay by um what is that guy's um last name is cusack he's like this uh my michael cusack is that his name he's a uh, he's australian animator i think i think he's australian but he does some really crazy shit yolo Look up YOLO okay. animation. Yeah, it's so. I think it's Michael Cusack. Yeah, that's his name. Yeah. He's sick, man. He does some really cool stuff. There's uh, that animator, Coco Freak Bean. You okay. heard of Coco Freak Bean? I haven't. Crazy. I need to see. Yeah. <laughs> Coco whoever, Freak Bean. whoever that is, right? Yeah. You definitely need to see some Coco Freak Bean. Um, there's a. Uh, man. There's a new series, uh, a web series called Night. It's not animated, but it's really cool, really cool concept. It doesn't get too many views, but it's like it was uh, it was going every day for for a while. It's a, a sleepwalking journal, but it's kind of like a it feels like a found footage type thing. Mm. It's really cool. So, with one of the characteristics of the record label Brain Fear is that. <clears throat> the people that you work with, the roster is really diverse, mm -hmm. making loads of different styles of music. This is obviously starting out with brain feed of films, but what's the what's the vision for it? What's the hope for it? Would you love to be able to give all those people you just mentioned like a platform to be able absolutely. to? That's the kind, that's absolutely, that's the ideal. That's, yeah, absolutely. You know, I just I want to use I want to have a platform for for artists to make their crazy films. You know, just like we have a platform for them to make their crazy music. We want them to be able to make their crazy movies and animations and stuff. I want to see a Salad Fingers TV show. Don't you? Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> what time they'd put it on and what channel they'd put it Dude. on, I don't know. But <laughs> Hello, Viceland. Are you out there listening? Surely. It's me, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. That would be cool. Whilst you were... Obviously, if you think back over the last 10 years and presume quite often it's been make a record, tour a record, mm -hmm. repeat. Has there always been an ambition in the back of your mind to be able to get to this point? And to... Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I've always wanted to be able to carve out some enough time to, to work on a film mm -hmm. and enough money to where I didn't have to go on the road and stuff mm -hmm. to where I can actually just focus on, on making something. You know, and even with creating music it's like i have to carve out time to do that i can't just be on the road all the time it's hard to get in the headspace of, mm. of uh of creating when you're playing it's just, i don't know it's just mm. two different sides of the brain for me and you know i think um even when this film is done i'm going to try and tour that mm. you know so it's, it's like it's almost like the same process mm. yeah. we talk about kuso in a moment which is the mm. film you make him I'm interested to know, we talked about working across those different disciplines, if you like, like making music, running a label, etc. Like, it feels like a characteristic of the music that you've always made has been quite, sp that you can be spontaneous and you can improvise and you sort of just follow wherever the kind of mood or the atmosphere takes you. Is filmmaking completely different to that? Um, can you be... Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. Because it requires so much planning. You know, I'm actually really curious on how of how like, you know guys like Gaspar Noé do it, and uh, you know a guy like Wong Kar Wai because they're known to just have you know very minimal scripts mm. and you know they just end up in these really beautiful locations though and they have these crazy you know uh, costumes though and they have all these other crazy elements. It's like how do you how do you improvise with that? Mm. You can't really, can you? It's like you can't just be like. I need this beautiful dress that looks like it's from the 1920s in like an hour because I'm just winging it. You know, you can't <laughs> do that. Uh, maybe you can when you're super rich and making that kind of movie, but I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, 
you can show up on a day and be like, you know what? We're actually going to do this very playfully. It's not going to be a serious scene. You're in the toilet. <laughs> and you're stuck in the toilet. And we're going to carry on this dramatic scene. But you're all on. You know, you're on the toilet. You're on the phone. Whatever. You just like, you can totally change it up. And, and it's a totally different feeling. So there's room for that. Mm. But, you know, a lot of those elements are just there. They have to be plotted out. You know, I like using a lot of practical effects. And, you know, if you want someone's head to explode, man, you need to have that shit prepped, like, weeks in advance. <laughs> That's not no overnight shit, dude. It's not no overnight joint. You know, so you can't improvise with that. You got to plan that, you know. So that's, that's the... <laughs> How do you make somebody's head explode? Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, you have to do, like, a face cast. You have to get your actor, and they have to, like, they have to put all this clay stuff on their face, and someone's got to make a mold of that and then paint it make a I don't know it's a lot of, it's a lot of shit yeah. a lot of shit and then you have to deal with somebody else who's gonna blow it up like afterward you know it's like it's like two different teams have to do that whole thing which you know it's crazy it's crazy the whole trickle down effect there's a guy who's painting the face there's a guy who does the hairs just the hairs of this character you know and um yeah, and then there's like maybe five people who have to blow it up, <laughs> you know, and all those people have to be paid on time. <laughs> so that's what's about how filmmaking is a complicated business. Yeah. Um, tell me a bit about Kuso because this so after Royal, this is what you've been spending a lot of your time this year working mm -hmm. on, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the first feature length movie you've made. Yeah. Or, okay, so Kuso Royal is part of Kuso. Okay. Yeah. When I set out to do Royal, I didn't know it was all going to be a feature film, but I wasn't, after I made Royal, I wasn't tired of the world that I was creating. I was like, oh man, there's so many stories I want to tell in this universe. So I was like, all right, well, fuck it, let's just keep going. You know, and I kind of figured the rest out as I was going. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm still, still figuring it out. Yeah. It's still kind of revealing itself to me what this whole thing is. Yeah. You know? So where does. Royal, the kind of fifteen minutes of royal mm -hmm. fit into Kuso broadly. It's uh it's kind of the glue of the movie. Okay. I think it's they're on the bookends of the movie. Yeah. And you've cast some film people in it. I have, yeah. yeah. So tell us a bit about who you've got involved. Yeah, um I got I got uh <laughs> so many fun people, man. There's so many funny people. It's a one thing. Hannibal like Burris, uh, I got uh Tim Heidecker, Anders Holm. From the Workaholics, Donnell Rawlings from the Chappelle Show, mm -hmm. the Buttress. She's a a rapper from New Jersey. Zach Fox, aka Booty Math. He's a crazy comedian from Atlanta. So you've managed to fill the room with all of your favorite people to make this film. Dude, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> it's so cool. I mean, it it was it's all it's not all at once. You know, I got George yeah. Clinton in the movie too. He's amazing. Yeah. Have you found George on set? Yo, George was amazing. Was he? George was amazing. George was amazing because he, like, he really freaked me out the, the day of. Because he, you know, what, he showed up on time. I was like, wow, he's here before everybody else. George is here on time, but he freaked me out. He pulls me to the side. He's like, hey, man, uh, so uh, where's the script? I was like, come on, man. Tell me. Tell me you know the lines. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't know the lines. He didn't know the lines. Like, we're about to shoot in, like, you know, an hour. He didn't know the dialogue or anything. And, but he learned it. And he, um, he he did a lot of improvising, too, which was really good. And he was just such a natural. He was like, yo, also, I've never acted before. I was like, you'll be fine, George. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm mean, acting advice yeah. to George Clinton. Yeah, I was like, what am I doing, man? This is crazy. Why am I doing this? Uh, <laughs> but uh, he killed it. He he just smashed it, and he is he's such a he's such a, a lovable, crazy character. Mm. Yeah. And what have been the the biggest challenges? Like, I mean, is it the finances? Is it the distribution? Because I presume you kind of like you throw yourself into this thing, and then every day there's probably something else 
comes to mind that you need to do or you need to pay for or yeah. to keep the project going? The money, obviously, would be great if someone else was paying for the project to be made. But um, be- besides that, it's just getting people on board, you know, getting people's time, you know, getting people to agree to work for less than they deserve, you know, because I can't afford to pay them what they deserve, you know, um, has been the biggest challenge, you know, getting someone to give you their 100% when they only have, like, a couple hours between, like, the real job Mm -hmm. and sleep, you know. So it's like, that's been the hardest part is just, you know, getting any kind of, you know, when you try to get time from, like, visual, anybody good, shit. I mean, anybody good is busy, right? So it's just, it's hard. It's hard. And what about the, um, the places that, like, inspiration comes from? Again, I read that you'd seen, like, the gif that somebody had mocked up of, like, you and Tom York a couple yeah. of years ago. And you actually found that, that sort of clicked something in your mind and gave you an idea. Yeah. I was, I was just so inspired because it made me laugh for so long. And it just made me think, like, man, I can make some shit like that. I know how to do animation a little bit. I can make something. Yeah. That'd be kind of fun. And then I started doing this, this animation, and then it just kind of turned into this whole fucking... Horrible movie. <laughs> and what's the... Um, That's not going to get anybody laid. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely not one it's of those definitely movies. not going to get you laid. It's actually the worst date movie of all time. Yeah, I can, I can agree with that. But yeah, I mean, probably um, just take someone you want to keep in the friend zone or never want to talk to again. Just bring them to the movie. <laughs> just finally, what are some of the best... Uh, conversations you've had with people after that they've seen this film so far like i presume it's been a mixture of people being like yeah yeah yeah, it's cool i was really into it and people being like just not being able to articulate what they even feel about it i think it's just it's going to be really fun to see it with the audience right now you know i'm really excited to be among them and you know it'll be really silly yeah but i think we'll be in with good company, especially if they're here for David Firth, you know. Um, but yeah, some some funny things, man. It, it's like, you we know, the only people. Seen it. Yeah, yeah. Only family made of it. My grandma loves it. My granny loves Royal. Yeah. She hasn't seen that. Yeah, she's she's seen it. <laughs> what, did, what did your granny say? She loved it. She loves this shit. You know, she's she laughed. She thought it was funny shit. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, I get my dark sense of humor from my family I think you know we always been like we're always not afraid to say horrible things at the dinner table and you know granny just farts you know all loud and blames me you know it's it's normal you know (laughs) Mm. but um but yeah it's uh it's been funny to just like some people just like oh really that's how you yeah that's what's going on up there huh Great. (laughs) I'm out. (laughs) Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Production by Emma Snook. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com. (laughs) 